tainted love, the idol of marriage. In the last few years, there has been a monumental shift in how society views and understands sex and sexuality. And the church has increasingly been pushed to the sidelines because of views that seem outdated, if not downright immoral. So what has changed? Why has it changed? And where does it leave people like me and people like you when it comes to each of us figuring out how to make our way through the difficult conversations, the uncomfortable decisions, and our own internal feelings? We're going to be looking now at a subject that is hugely challenging to the way I live my life and also question something that as a society we hold as an absolute truth and an inalienable human right and that's the subject of sexual relationships or marriage. But before we dive into this I want to highlight just a few important things. Firstly, I'm a Christian pastor therefore I am offering what I believe to be a Christian understanding and response to this topic. I'm also a white, male, middle-aged, married, heterosexual, so my first-hand knowledge of many of these subjects are limited and somewhat skewed. Secondly, I recognise with humility that my beliefs and understanding around some of these subjects may change over time. All I can offer is what I sincerely believe to be true now. Thirdly, I understand that this is not, for many people, a topic to be discussed intellectually but a life-altering issue that has brought much trouble, heartbreak and soul-searching. And that the church's best response is to show love, kindness and compassion and not to fall into the temptation to draw battle lines and hold theological standpoints. We're talking about real people here. And lastly, number four, this is a massive subject. So no one talk or video is enough to do the topic justice. And that's why we're taking a whole month to look at this topic. And even then, we're only scratching the surface. So if you want to know what we as a church community think about sex and sexuality, please stick with us. Don't just grab a soundbite from one talk, but instead persevere and explore this topic with us so that we can learn that together. So with that in mind, let's get started. Part one, the lie. When I was a teenager, my mum was very concerned that I didn't have a girlfriend. After all, it was normal. It was a normal thing for a teenage boy to have a girlfriend. I mean, what I didn't tell her was that none of the girls I knew were remotely interested in me. It wasn't exactly a choice I had made. And that concern continued into my 20s. And I remember a time when my dad, in response to what he deemed as unnecessary fussiness on my part, warned me of the dangers of being alone. That if I didn't pick a girl, get married and settle down, I would become a lonely old man. I guess it's not really surprising that my parents would react in this way to my singleness. Because society is constantly telling us that happiness, fulfilment, purpose is found in a sexual relationship, if not a marriage. Every love film was about two people finding each other, finding love and finding happiness. Every love song is about the excitement of hooking up or the pain of breaking up. It's as if our lives revolve around the fear of loneliness and the need to be loved. So we are peddled the lie through virtually every medium that you are only complete in a sexual relationship and that you're a failure in life if you're single. That life starts when you're married. You can accomplish far more with a partner. We even go as far as thinking that the solution to all our problems in life will be found in a long-term relationship. So the ideal that we in the West have created is a nuclear family, two adults with 2.4 children, safe, secure, stronger together. And yet this isn't the way it's always been. In fact, the family as we see it now is a Victorian invention. No longer did large, extended, multi-generational families dominate. Instead, as society moved away from farming and industry and cities took off, smaller family units became the norm. The idea of hearth and home became an ideal with the family being less of an economic unit and more of a sanctuary from the world out there. These smaller family groupings allowed for privacy and escape from people that, well, we didn't really want to be with anyway. And they were a place where children were nurtured and encouraged to leave the nest, find their fortunes, marry and settle down perpetuating the ideals of their parents. In fact, as this new way of living took hold, the average age of marriage dropped. Why? 
because young men who had left their families, well, they were lonely. This perfect way of living probably reached its peak in the 1950s with one magazine in the States in a 1957 survey finding that more than half of respondents said that unmarried people were sick, immoral or neurotic. Having said that, what we found at this time is that although the large farming families were a thing of the past, groupings of nuclear families still depended on one another, being a part of one another's lives and still holding to the old African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. But then the cracks began to show. Divorce rates had been increasing for many years up to this point, but that was to accelerate. The invention and proliferation of televisions in homes had a significant impact on how people lived their lives and caused families to become increasingly insular. People moved away from their families for work reasons, so the home and the family became an island of security in a sea of unfamiliarity. As one reporter wrote, Over the past two generations, the physical space separating nuclear families has widened. Before, sisters-in-law shouted greetings across the street to each other from their porches. Kids would dash from home to home and eat out of whoever's fridge was closest by. But lawns have grown more expansive and porch life has declined, creating a buffer of space that separates the house and family from anyone else. Now, things have moved a long way from the 1950s idea of marriage. In fact, a survey of 1,000 American young people between the ages of 18 and 35 found that they no longer believed in the institution of marriage, at least not in its traditional form. 40% believed that the till death do us part vow should be abolished. And almost half supported the idea of a two-year trial period after which a marriage could be dissolved with no divorce or paperwork required. And this very much comes out of the realisation that marriage is not the solution, that almost half of all marriages fail, and many people are trapped in lonely or abusive relationships, holding on to their toxic relationship out of a sense of duty or obligation. And yet, these young people, they still believe that life will be more fulfilled when shared with a sexual partner, even if it's not forever. The younger generation isn't afraid of commitment, they instead become serial monogamists, moving from one committed relationship to the next. As Bruno Mars sung, It's a beautiful night, we're looking for something dumb to do. Hey baby, I think I want to marry you. If we wake up and you want to break up, that's cool. No, I won't blame you, it was just fun. As a church, we cannot underestimate how much this worldview has crept into our pews and pulpits. We celebrate and uphold the institution of marriage. We encourage young people to settle down and find a partner for life. Our churches revolve around family life, and yet we struggle to become the inclusive, welcoming community that God has called us to be because we're made up of exclusive private family groupings that are better suited to modern living but leave us with a deep yearning for something more. Marriage or a long-term sexual relationship is not the answer. And yet despite theological stances or biblical understandings, we still believe it is. I remember when I was at university, a friend of mine had recently become a Christian, but he still struggled with life. He had an addictive personality that made it difficult to ditch his dependence on cigarettes and alcohol. And he was gay, although at that time he hadn't come out. Really his life was a mess and he wasn't happy. But then a few years later, I saw on Facebook that he, that he had found love. He'd settled down with a nice guy. At least he looked nice in the pictures. And it wasn't long before they were married. Now I hold to what I believe is a biblical understanding of marriage, where it's confined to being between two members of the opposite sex. And yet, when I saw this news on Facebook, I was happy. I was pleased for him because he had finally found someone who could love him and support him in life. He could find security, stability and happiness because he was married. See, we end up pitting our theological viewpoints against our pastoral love and care and love usually wins. Because we don't like the idea of people being single. We don't like the idea of people not having children. We, like my dad, don't like the idea of those that we love becoming old and lonely. On both sides of the sexuality debates, celibacy is viewed as bad. It's a dirty word 
A marriage or a long-term sexual relationship becomes an idol, a place where true intimacy is found, and any effort by the church to prevent this, well, it's a deprivation of our humanity, and therefore a violation of our human rights. As one gay Christian man complained to the writer David Bennett, it's just not fair that as Christians we have to give up any prospect of a romantic relationship with a person we are attracted to. Everyone else has the option of marriage. I don't. I want to have a family. I want a partner and children. Why can everyone else have that? And I can't. Part two, the truth. So what is the truth? What is the answer? Are we condemning people to unhappiness and loneliness because of a draconian and outdated theology? Well, yes and no. Perhaps we are guilty of forgetting that the two most important people in the Christian faith, that's Jesus, obviously, and Paul, well, they were single celibate men. Let's start with Jesus, which is always a good place to start. Jesus, as well as being the Son of God, was was part of a traditional Jewish family. He had a father and a mother, brothers and sisters. He lived in a culture where having a partner and children was seen as a blessing from God. I mean, just read Psalm 128. And yet he took a very different view of what family was. There is one occasion recorded in Matthew's account of Jesus' life and ministry where Jesus' mother and brothers turn up as Jesus taught the crowds. And someone goes up to Jesus, stops him in mid-flow and lets him know that well, your family are outside, they want to speak to you. And this is what Jesus said in reply. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples and said, These are my mother and my brothers. Anyone who obeys my father in heaven is my brother or sister or mother. Here we see Jesus making a cultural shift away from the traditional family to stating that his friends, not his bloodline, were his true family. The family was primarily defined by obeying God and following Jesus rather than marriage, sex and procreation. And this is the pattern that the church follows as it unfolds in the New Testament. That it's the church, not our blood relatives, that are truly our family. But Jesus is even more controversial a few verses earlier. This is what he says. If you love your father or mother or even your sons and daughters more than me, you are not fit to be my disciples. And unless you are willing to take up your cross and come with me, you are not fit to be my disciples. If you try to save your life, you will lose it. But if you give it up for me, you will surely find it. Now this really speaks directly against the idol of marriage and family. Jesus is basically saying that in order to follow him, you need to get rid of the idea that to have a life, you need to buy into the lies of the world. That unless you are willing to put Jesus above marriage, above sex, above family, unless you are willing to sacrifice your life, your lives and all your aspirations, dreams and ambitions, you are not fit to be a follower of Jesus. I mean, wow, that's extreme. And we don't often preach that in churches because we are sensitive to the pastoral needs within our church community. We don't want to make people's lives unnecessarily hard or demand too much. But Jesus didn't seem to have that same issue. So what about Paul? Well, Paul was a hero of the early Jesus movement, a key leader and teacher of the early church, with a particular focus on non-Jews, followers of Jesus that came into the faith with little understanding of the Jewish scriptures, that's the Old Testament, and a worldview that understood sex and marriage very differently. In our last talk, I read to you from a letter he wrote to the church in the Greek city of Corinth. It's a letter where he has a lot to say about sex and marriage, and he addresses directly the issue of celibacy. He affirms marriage. He said it's a good thing, an exclusive sexual relationship. But he goes on to affirm those who, like him, aren't married, telling everyone to be content in the situation that God has placed them in. In fact, Paul goes even further than that by answering a question put to him. Is it best for people not to marry? And this is what Paul says. I want all of you to be free from worry. An unmarried man worries about how to please the Lord. But a married man has more worries. He must worry about the things of this world because he, put, he wants to please his wife. So he is pulled in two directions. Paul says the same about women and then goes on to say this. 
What I am saying is for your own good. It isn't to limit your freedom. I want to help you to live right and to love the Lord above all else. In fact, he says that a widow would be happier if she didn't remarry. And this is a very different view of a fulfilled life which is extolled by the world, who say, if at first you don't succeed, try and try again. Instead, Paul is saying, don't strive for it. Be content with what you have. In fact, remaining single is the right way to live in undivided devotion to the Lord. But is it really that easy? Unfortunately not. And mainly because I think as a church, we have made it more difficult for people to be single and celibate. So let's look at the problem. Part three, the problem. In a previous teaching series called A Game of Thrones, we looked at a society that had placed the worship of other gods above their worship and devotion to God. We looked at Augustine's idea of disordered loves, where we love good things but in the wrong order. See, marriage and sex and family, well, they're good things. They're a gift, a blessing from God, but they were never meant to be the number one thing in life, to be pursued above all other wants and desires. No, instead, as we read earlier, the number one priority for a follower of Jesus is to love God, even if that means having to sacrifice everything else. But the reality is that by giving in to what society says is best, by placing family and marriage on a pedestal, the church has made life more difficult for those who wish to remain celibate. In fact, we're not entirely sure what to do with these strange unmarried people. Instead, we focus on families. We have marriage courses, parenting courses, toddler groups. So when a single man or woman turns up at our church, well, we're a bit stumped. Can we really cater for them? Who will they be friends with? When I returned to the church I grew up in after university, I was single and in my 20s, but that was pretty normal. I was blessed to be in a church that was full of people in a similar life stage to me. So my time was filled with work, serving the church and hanging out with my single friends. Now there was one couple who did get married straight after uni but they got stuck in with the singles and even when their first child came along we all became uncles and aunts to this bundle of joy that was our first real experience of a baby. There was also a lovely family who, well they seemed really old to me at the time, they were married, had two kids and in their late 30s they took me under their wing, they welcomed me into their family, they gave me a seat at their table and made me feel loved and accepted. Now there was, of course, that couple that got together and we rarely saw them again. They were too wrapped up in each other to be involved with anyone else. And it annoyed us, but we still had each other to keep ourselves amused and happy. Yes, there were still occasions where I felt lonely. But because of the support network around me and the friendships I had formed, I was able to be content and I was even able to say to God, Look, I want to meet someone. I want to get married. But ultimately, I want to put my devotion to you above all other things. So, if marriage is not your will for my life, well, I'm not happy about it, but it's okay. And it's this attitude that in time led to me leaving my hometown, family and friends, and going to Bible college, because I was willing to sacrifice what I had in order to follow Jesus. But that culture changes as you get older. I mean, what about the person who remains single as all their friends pair off? get married and have children and no longer need the support and social life that other singles provided. Life gets increasingly difficult and increasingly lonely for those who don't fit into the family moulds and the church finds it difficult to cater to their needs. So the challenge I want to put out there is it's not to the single people to be celibate and avoid worshipping marriage as an idol. No, my challenge is to those who are married and a nuclear family who have become exclusive, private, and a barrier to the inclusive, extended, multi-generational family that Jesus called the church to be. This is a challenge that is as much for me as it is for any of you listening to this. And it's not simple. The most important things never are. And I know from experience, I'm married with three kids and two dogs, that fitting everything into my busy schedule is hard. I have work to do, school runs, clubs in the evening, dinner to cook, children to put to bed, all creating an incredibly tight and demanding timetable. I'm also aware of the need to invest in my marriage, date nights, time alone with my spouse. So when it comes to friendships, we look for other families to connect with, who understand us and life's pressures. What do children get on as well as the adults? 
And that's not that easy. It's as if we're consumers looking for friendships that meet our needs rather than the needs of others. So how on earth do I fit a single person into the mix? And if we really admit it, we're a bit suspicious of them. Perhaps we even echo in our hearts the finding of that 1957 survey that single people are sick, immoral or neurotic. I mean, there must be something wrong with them or else they wouldn't be single, right? We are willing to protect our family at all costs because it's the most important thing to us. Ed Shaw, in his book, The Plausibility Problem, The Church and Same-Sex Attraction, writes this. So, if you have a family, you can reasonably feel you have time for no one else. But that can mean that unless you have a family, you feel you have no one at all. And that does not make the single life feel plausible to anyone, most of all for the biblically faithful, same-sex attracted Christian who doesn't even have the hope of having their own family at some stage. Can we truly ask a same-sex attracted Christian to make such a massive sacrifice if we aren't willing to make a big sacrifice ourselves? Isn't it the height of hypocrisy to look down on people who pursue a sexual relationship over holiness when we've done exactly the same thing but labelled it as okay because we're heterosexual? We all need to take a good, hard look at our own lives and realise that our priorities point to disordered loves that need some serious sorting out. Part 4. The Solution So what's the solution? What are we aiming for here? Do we reject biblical teaching labelling it as outdated and even immoral? Or do we take the challenge of being church seriously? I mean, what would Jesus do? I think you know the answer to that question. Ed Shaw, who I quoted earlier, gives this solution. Number one, act out the Christian reality that family equals church. Number two, recognise the misstep that family equals mum and dad and two-point children. Number three, talk to people of different ages and life situations to find out what they need the most. Don't assume because everyone is different. Some people may find family meals hard time because it reminds them of what they haven't got, but they'd love a meal out with a friend. And number four, don't just talk, do something. Ask yourself the question, who in my church family am I going to invite around to watch TV or go on a dog walk or even invite on a holiday? See, being a church family doesn't necessarily mean adding a load more stuff to your already crammed full to-do list. Take a step towards opening your lives to others. Sacrifice privacy and isolation and allow others into your life. People who are perhaps lonely and yet have so much to offer. And only then can we start to truly be the multi-generational, loving, inclusive church that Jesus wants us to be. A church that offers a Christian faith that is both attractive and livable. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to this talk. There's a load more resources out there on our YouTube channel, not just about sex and sexuality, but about all sorts of things in the Christian faith. So do subscribe to our YouTube channel and do follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And if you do have any questions around this subject, and do send them to gotquestions at hawleybaptist.org.uk and we'd love to have that conversation with you. Thanks for watching.